Skin Cam with Jubei Podcast and Jubei Me's message. And today's message is the lands between Nigeria and Congo. I'm glad that you guys are here with me. I'm very uh, happy to be here. It's Friday and uh, and I'm just, just glad that uh, we're all together one more time. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, like I said, uh, we have some, uh, we're on every platform, uh, all over the place. We're on, uh, we're on Anchor. We're on YouTube. We're on uh, Apple, and we've got a few more surprises towards the end. So uh, just hold tight. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and let's get started. Uh, I don't like. I don't believe in uh, hijacking people's time, seeing a lot of fillers, and let's get down to the business. Uh, let me see here. All right. We're at, this is night nice school, King Cam, night nice school session number seven. Um, and I'm, and the question is, we're on chapter four. We're on chapter four. Um, people want to know what, where are we? We are in chapter four. So between, the land between the Jir and the Congo, not, I know the word is spelled different or kind of uh, in a different way. It is spelled N-I-G-E-R, and the G is pronounced with a J, Niger and the Congo. And so what is between them? What lies between them? See, we have did a lot of traveling, and I'm just glad that you're on this journey with me. Uh, I'm learning, and, and I, I, I would love for us to continue to learn together, okay? Now, this is an introduction to African history. This is geared just for you, just for you, and it's designed to foster a life of learning. Uh, this um, this kind of course or this segment uh, kind of gets you started. I understand we have the Dr. Benz, Dr. John Henry Clarks, and, and Francis Welsing, and so many others, Amos Wilson, you name it. But this can kind of bridge that gap from, from elementary level to, say, the middle uh, the middle uh, middle school levels, intermediate level. So, um, I really uh, think that uh, if you if we learn together, we get a little bit more foundational information every week. We'll be in good shape. All right. So, this this would be once a week, but of course, last week I was busy doing teacher stuff. I was a mentor teacher. Uh, so, and also the department chair. So we had to do a lot of things. So, my apologies. Okay. So it will be once a week and we'll go over a few readings on the continent. And a lot of people uh, for many times over ask, okay, what about the other places, other civilizations outside of Kemet? And we're gonna do just that. And we have been doing that. So uh, just let me know how well we're doing and we're gonna, we're gonna keep it moving, yeah? All right, so we're, the, we, we're trying to cover the sub-regions of Africa. Keep in mind, I don't agree with everything but I just, you know, but this map, um, it, 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 it describes the northern region of Africa, the West African region, the central, south, and then the southern and eastern. Keep in mind that before these state or country lines was drawn out by the uh, Berlin Conference, a lot of these regions was flowing together, especially along the Nile River valleys and so on. So, and the uh, the Niger River and so, and so, many, so many others, but, um, the, these boundary lines and country lines are, didn't really exist, okay? So, we're still in the book, The Lost Cities of Africa by Basil Davidson. Very good book, very, very thorough. But, you know, of course, just like anything, I, there are times I do disagree with the man, but however, it's pretty. it's a pretty comprehensive book. It's a pretty comprehensive work, and um, he 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 highlights multiple regions of Africa. Um, he did spend a lot of time in West Africa, of course, very famous. But there were other places, so uh, we're going to get right into it. Okay, don't forget to recap: Were there any cities or empires outside of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai? If you missed that episode, uh, I'm going to put that in, in the in the description box, so you're gonna see it somewhere uh, in uh, on YouTube. So if you missed it, check it out, all right? There are other empires outside of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. 
um, believe it or not, see, but when we talk about West Africa, we normally would lean towards those famous empires like Mansa Musa and uh, the kings like Mansa Musa and and the the, the university at, at Timbuktu. But there were so many others. Uh, did they use different script to communicate? They did use a different kind of script, and they used it uh, while while um, employing another uh, language. So they used their language inside of a language. All right. And lastly, did you know about the small crown jewel? Okay. So check that out. Okay. Let's get into the discussion. Uh, we're gonna we will identify and discuss the major concepts in the book entitled The Lost Cities of Africa in chapter four. We are in chapter four. I'm very happy about this. I love what we're doing and I love this book. And so um, I'm excited. Okay, here are the main questions, okay, or essential questions. First question is, what cities were between Niger and Congo? Okay, that's the first question. What city, and we're gonna to try to answer that. What cities were between Niger and Congo? Next question, what is the great distortion? According to Basil Davidson, there was a great distortion. What was it, what was it? How many Africans were taken? According to the book, how many Africans were taken? Okay, lastly, why was Benin art so highly regarded? Okay, you know, and so so there's so many things that we're gonna we're gonna address, but let's get down to it. Uh, chapter four, between uh, the cities between Nigeria and the Congo, what is between them? Let's get to it now. There's a place called Beyond the Savannah in the in the section Beyond the Savannah, and uh, the, this called the grasslands. The grasslands proved to be just as much, according to Davidson, uh, just as much as, as a barrier to foreign people as the desert. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I didn't think of it like that. You know, when you're used to some kind of one kind of terrain and then you encounter this one, it may be different, you know. So the grassland proved to be just mu as much as a barrier to foreign people, people outside of this area uh, as the desert did. And now, just like many other cities and places in Africa, they traded with each other. They did. They, that was their means of commerce. Uh, it, I know it's kind of hard to uh, to to uh, visualize that, especially in a world full of currency and fiat currency. But bartering was the thing. But they bartered things of value. Yes, uh, I do. Uh, speaking of that, I am a economics teacher also, and I do teach a little bit about supply and demand. And so um, it's important to get that understanding that there are things that are valuable to us that we would we would trade. And we and, and so it's pretty cool that they traded with each other. They traded whatever they could. Unfortunately, there were some things that they would, there were some resources they traded that they should not have, but let's get into it. They traded gold for sure, colonists and slaves. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, let's let's address the elephant in the room. Let's go and get into it. Okay. This commerce called, you know, the slave trade, this thing called the slave trade, which is which is evil in and of itself. Let, let's address it. Yes, Africans were doing that to each other. We, it was happening. Even now, we still have sellouts. Let's be honest with you, right? But it was in a sense to where, okay, this person and their children would have been eventually be grafted in, to my understanding. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. You can comment and uh, and everything. Put something in the comments, but. Uh, over time, it was not like Western slavery where it was supposed to be perpetual and forever. Names were taken, um, language was taken, and so on. When, say, the Hausa uh, took in another uh, group of people because of war or whatever, their children and the children's children will soon become Hausa. You're looking at somebody um, was a product of that. Okay? So, not even... And here's the funny part, dealing with the grassland, dealing with this area. This is this is 
this area we talk about Chad, we talk about uh, Cameroon, we talk about the the Congo and Angola. This was a place that King Mansa Musa or even Askia they didn't enter, they didn't come to this place. It was a barrier. Yes, they traded along the Bilali Sudan, but going south, they was like, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> but people were still living there, though. It wasn't desolate. It wasn't an uninhabited. We've already proved the point that the Batwa people was living in the, uh, in the, in, in the Bakongo, in Uganda, and many others. But famous kings like Mansa Musa and many others didn't go in this direction. But people still live there, right? Beyond the savannah. Now, now the the Akan the Akan people uh, migrated southward uh, beyond the savannah. They did. Remember, let me show you. Let me get back to it. Ghana, Nigeria. Is you know I know uh, the picture that I have on YouTube may just describe the the central and western part, but. Um, we, this this land, okay, beyond Niger, okay, south of Niger, that's Nigeria, that's Benin, Togo, Ghana. Shout out to the Ivory Coast. That whole southern, that that southwestern, that central part, along Cameroon, along that coast, that is what we're talking about. So those people did migrate. They did move back and forth. The Akan people migrated southward beyond the uh, savannah. Why were they able to migrate southward or even have knowledge of it? See, remember we said Master Musa didn't do it, but other people did. Yeah? So, how did they do it? They have knowledge of it? Or, you know, what do you think, guys? What do you think? Basically, when I found they had a similar culture, that's how they was able to do it. Now, some some families and some ethnic groups up north may not have, um, blend, they may not they may not have uh, meshed well with each other. There was Africans for sure, but culturally too different. However, in between that, the lands beyond the savannah, between Niger and Bakongo, they had some they had a similar culture. Had a similar culture, okay. So, once again, these places beyond the savannah, this is Nigeria, Cameroon, Angola, Chad, Ghana, all this. All these places, similar culture. And the account, they had a similar ancestry. Hmm. We talked about migration patterns. We talked about going, coming from the east westward and so on. They had a similar ancestry. Okay, according to Davidson, the Akan people had an ancient capital called Bonu Mansu, whose founding fathers came from the great white desert in the north. So they had similar culture, similar ancestry. They said, look, our ancestors came from the great white desert. It sound like the, uh, it's the L reason, my, um, if I'm thinking about it, right? You know, so think about that. Yes, we have our books, but in our oral traditions, a lot of our elders mention where they came from. Okay, because before there was uh, letters, before there was something written, we told a story. We said, once upon a time, this happened, that happened. Or uh, this king took out a snake, and then here come the house, or they came from the east or, 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 or places like that. So we have to listen to our elders when they tell these stories. Yeah? All right. So beyond the savannah. When, but here's the thing. Whenever Europe described West Africa, it was only from a European perspective. Yeah, duh, right? But they, they lacked, it was lacking depth and even the necessary information to paint a complete picture because they only knew certain things. They didn't go into detail. Why? Because one reason is uh, because they didn't reach the interior. They were just along the coast. They were just, you know, just barely getting through. They only focused on the West Coast and that, you know, the, the coastal regions and, uh, you know, Senegambia and many other places. They, they, they didn't go, like we would say, off in there. Right? <laughs> they didn't go, they didn't go that way. No. 
Think about it. If some Africans didn't go further uh, into the interior, certainly uh, foreigners weren't, right? But this is before, keep in mind, this is before imperialism. This is before colonialism. This is before all this was happening, okay? So all they could describe is maybe Timbuktu, okay? Maybe uh, Martania and Morocco and some places like that, but uh, that was it, all right? So that, but their goal, of course, it wasn't for you know he, human interaction. It wasn't for uh, peace or, or of any kind. Their goal was capital gain, okay, to get gold resources and of course Africans. Because by now, by now uh, we're in the 13th and 14th century, um, you know the 1400s, and 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 what's happening is that there is an awakening in Europe, and because of their scarcity where they are. They try to figure out uh, a way out of this issue, and they feel that slave and African slave labor would be the answer. So they began their onslaught, all right? But remember, up until this point, there was no, there was not a thing like this. This was not, this was totally different, okay? So, the land beyond the savannah, wherever Europe described West Africa, it was only basic. Um, yes, we had Leo Africanus. Yes, we had many others, but we're talking about the interior. We're talking about the western central part of Africa. Okay? Now, Basil Davidson talked about the great distortion. What happened? I kind of alluded to it already. I kind of jumped ahead of myself, but, you know, I'm excited about this. What is the, the great distortion? What happened? What impacted Africa? It was like a bomb hitting it, right? And what was the phenomenon worse than the Black Death of Europe? You see, I, I would tell my students, yes, that you know, the there was a Black Plague in Europe, but there was some, uh, there was other things happening around the world. Okay, so uh, what was the phenomenon worse than the Black Death of Europe? And what was the Great Distortion, according to Basil Davidson? Check it out the slave trade that was very devastating and I'm going to be even handed with it it wasn't just Europe it was not just the European uh, slave trade the people the uh, there was an Arab slave trade that was that was getting us also so people for so for, for the people who do not understand as to why Africa could not do certain things during a certain period of time was because they Africa was being stripped both sides of the coast. Both, both sides. They was fighting every front and it was being taken on every front. Think about that. Think about if you're trying to defend your home and people come through your front door and your back door. Right? Think about it like that. The slave trade. That was the devastating moment of African history. It didn't, it cast a, like Dr. John Henry Clark, it, I think he said he casted a shadow in our history. Okay? Now, great distortion. How many Africans were taken, according to Basil Davidson? Uh, according to Basil Davidson, millions were taken away or perished overseas. Millions. Millions. And uh, for for uh, for people to to um, to kind of doubt about situations about slave ships, did they ever exist? Uh, there are primary sources of people that drew the Africans on the slave ship. Come on now, let's think together. Okay, millions were taken away or perished overseas. All right, so now in one segment, I think this is in the page in uh, page one hundred and thirty. Is I think. Let me find my. So I'm going through the information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, for those who follow the book. This starts on page one thirty. Uh, the Great Distortion, uh, Portugal. He calls the role. Portugal took 1,389,000 between the years 18, uh, 1486 and 1641. 1,389,000. Yeah. 
that's a lot of people. Okay? And even and even that, he, he goes even further, over 52,000 from Angola alone. Just, just that one area, just that one country. 52,000 people taken out of Angola. That's that's a lot of like my the city where 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 that I teach. That's the whole city right there. 52,000 people. That's a lot. And then they were taken. We talking about taken away or perished. A lot of them died on the way there. Yeah. A lot of them died on the way there. And we have to understand this was the reality of our ancestors, of my ancestors. This was their reality. Their brothers were taken, sisters, mothers were taken, children were taken. Not to be seen ever again. Great distortion. But now, how do was how was it able to do that? Of course, divide and conquer. Wars provoked slavery. Some fought, hoping that the Europeans would not enslave them. I mean, I got I got to do this, or or, or they're going to take me and mine. But that wasn't always the case because eventually. The, the machine of slavery turned on them. But there were a series of slave revolts, African revolts across Africa. They did not, our ancestors did not take this line down. Okay, they had swords. A lot of these pretty swords that are designed now is not, it wasn't just for show. Okay, they, they you can get that work. All right, so some of our ancestors did fight back. They did fight back. They they did not accept the slave status without a fight. They weren't... The narrative is, uh, especially when I was growing up, the narrative is that, you know, especially when you watch the video, they just gradually just, just, just with their heads down, just making their way to the ship. No, they, they was fighting. They was fighting on their way to the ship. They was fighting on the ship. Because they didn't understand why they was being taken and what was going on to them, what was happening to them. And so, and so the, the, the chiefs were doing it. And so they they had their warriors fight. Okay. And so let me let me let me read this. Let me read this. This is in con in of course I, I alluded to this. Contrary to popular belief, Africans were defending themselves from being captured. And of course, we may get into the Americas when uh, Africans were throwing hands in America also. It wasn't just people singing, we shall overcome. People were swinging too. Okay, let that sink in. We are human beings also. I remember a picture of a, of a man in the civil rights movement. He has a sign saying, I am a man. You know? So we may get into that. All right, let me know. All right. But now here's the thing that really caught my attention during this process. And I guess I, you know, you hear it many times over and over again, but when you read it and really realize what was happening, uh, it was happening. So um, as this process was happening, OK, I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read this to you. I think on page 133, um, it was talking about the great distortion and the once they got onto the ship. This is the thing that really kind of shook me a little bit. Uh, it says, it might be different from the state of mind of those European bishops of the Congo who sat decade after decade, Basil Davidson says, decade after decade, after decade in an ivory chair on the quarry side of uh, Lu uh, Luanda and extended their merciful hand in the wholesome baptism of the slaves. Decade after decade, in an ivory chair on the quarry side, the uh, quarry side of Lu uh, Luanda, 
and extended their merciful hand in the wholesome baptism of slaves who were rolled beneath, going in chains to the ships that would carry them to the Middle Passage to Brazil. They was they was baptizing slaves in, who was who was in the bottom of the ship. That shook me. What kind of human being are you to to call yourself baptizing them, christening them while they're in chains? Maybe it was to appease their conscience because they know they were straight up living foul. You know, I, I, I need to do right by them. No, you need to let them go. So yeah, baptizing them while, while they're in chains in the bottom of a ship on their way to Brazil, on their way to many other places. And the thing is, they believe that the Africans were inferior to them and had no soul but when a lot of their authors a lot of their people got there and had interaction with our ancestors beyond the savannah between the Jew and Congo they were more Christian than they were they treated with them with love and kindness better than their European counterparts and so I've always said we have always been civilized. We have always been a civilized people. However, the issue is we have allowed them to impose their views or impose their way of life on us. So we're starting to act more like them now instead of being civilized, instead of being just and upright as we can be. All right. But let me move on. Let me. Okay, now we on Benin now. Benin, and this is a great discovery for me. Um, once again, this is one of the lands beyond uh, between Nigeria and Congo, right? Benin, a very it's a small place, but it's a powerful place. People do not understand the weight that Benin really has. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right, Benin, in an expedition, okay, of course, this is after the Berlin Conference, they found several hundred bronze statues suggested of, of an almost Egyptian design. Hmm. I mean, we're not saying is they looked exactly the same when you line them up, but they suggested, wait a minute, this is very um, intricate. Very detailed, reminds of uh, us of the the New Kingdom work and so on. Mag- according to, in page one thirty nine, said they said magnificent, uh, magnificently carved mass. They was carved very well. Attention to detail, right? They were designed so well that the people who found it believed that the people of Atlantis made it on the lost continent. What the heck? Even back then, they was attributing the work of African people to people from out of space or from somewhere else. Certainly, these Africans could not have made this or built this or done this. Uh, the Atlantis, the people of Atlantis did this. No, the Africans in Africa did this. And we can still do great things. We should do it so well to where, man, ain't no way. But the good part is we have recordings. We can record it. We can show them what we can do. But we just got to believe in ourselves. Right? So, they found works of bronze, brass, right? And then they found another set of bronzes uh, found in One, Oni of Ife outside of Benin. So it wasn't just one place. It was several places that had bronze work. You know, 
just like the pyramids. Uh, the pyramid, it just didn't happen in Giza. It was a, a series of, body, or should I say, a body of work along the Nile Valley. It wasn't just in Egypt, way up north in the Delta. It was in Sudan and, for, and, and further south. Right? Now, remember our discussion, our Westwood discussion. Remember uh, about a, a couple of uh, sessions ago, we talked about that movement. Okay? Now, the, the culture um, was the African culture, no matter where they were, was going to be African. Okay, and so there were some similarities or unity in diversity, like Bayes Davidson like to say. Their their modes and means of worship and self-expression, they may have named them differently, but you will see some unity there. And so you will see some evidence of their life and what they saw and what they believed. And so you will see them how they how they would make the king. Uh, and his queen um, the focal point just like in Egypt just like in Kush you see that in other African nations okay so they they believe that the spirits are immortal they believe that the, there was a power that that fueled, that, that, that fueled the sun no they did not worship the sun no they didn't worship a cow they realized that God was in everything and was everywhere so they reverenced nature they reverence that energy behind it. so but you see and according to the book they would say the Egyptians uh, basically according to Davidson the, the Egyptians spearheaded everything no the Egyptians learned from the Nubians but also that culture transferred and moved westward because Kemetic and Kush culture I said many times is an African culture and, and Africans poured into the Nile Valley and the Nile Valley poured back out. Okay? And so let's get let's get into it. The Nile Valley influence moved westward. Westward as came in, as the country fell, a lot of uh, to the hands of the foreigners, they moved they moved out west. The Sao people and even further west of Europe people would have their divine kings and priests of the ram and of the sun. And Shango had a ram's mask. But now, get this. Get this. We discussed this before, but here's something else. Uh, let's move back east. Did the Yoruba people know about ancient Maroi? We had these discussions about the influence. You know, you can check it out. But let's lean further into this. We're going back to the east. Did the Yoruba people know about, the, about ancient Maroi? I think so. I think so. Because remember... Lake Chad and Niger and those places uh, was the bridge between the east and west, right? Because there was artifacts indicated that they did, and bronze case, case casting was made by the uh, made in, by the lost wax method of Maroi. So the way they made their artifacts, the way they made their their casts and their vessels was very similar to Kush. I didn't say that. Basil Davidson did. And the people that went and did the groundwork and did the spade and the, the digging did that did that for us. And these people were not black people, ladies and gentlemen. These people were Europeans that was making the connections. I'm just saying, they put two and two together. So the Europe, there were some some you could see those those tracks going from West Bank to the east. They were all connected. And it wasn't a brief moment. Uh, this form was established after the fall of Moroi. And so you see these artifacts strewn all over uh the lands between Niger and Congo. They may they may name it differently. They may do things differently. However, the style of work was the same. The mode of respecting elders was the same. The way things were very matrilineal was, was the same across multiple uh, places. Okay? So matrilineal, what I mean by that? Matrilineal means 
the uh, the the king's rulership was legitimized or was, was legit through the mother and not his father matrilineal okay so let's recap what cities or what places were between the Jew and Congo name one but there was quite a few right and what was what is the great distortion according to Basil Davidson what is the great distortion and how many Africans were taken? Of course, we know that's that's just a hard estimate. But we just talking about um, <clears throat> we talking about what did Davidson uh, say? We know that it may be more, right? And why is Benin art so highly regarded? Okay. Now, so what's next? We will discuss chapter five. We will discuss chapter five. And for more on Central Africa, check out Home Team. He's real good. Sankofa, Pan-African Series, and AE Learning. They're awesome. And um, before we we go, uh, prayers. We're going to pray for peace, unity, and stability for our family in Long Leave, Sahel region, and the Congo. We cannot, uh, we, we, we can't lose sight of our own African people that are suffering right now. So if you can, and I think you should, if you can pray, you should pray. Yeah. All right. So just listen to King Camel Jube podcast. Jube means message. And the message is what's the cities between Niger and Congo. Okay. But I told you, thank you for, for staying with me. I got a, a special surprise for you. A um, couple of things. This has, this show uh, has been brought to you by many great people. It's been brought to you by Peachy Cam Events and Designs. And let me let me get to my screen here. The Ellis County African American Hall of Fame Museum and Library. I am yours truly. I am the uh, the new president of the, the board of directors. President. So uh, much love to them. Uh, also, Pan African Connection Bookstore in Dallas. Okay, shout out to Pan African Bookstore and Irie Smokehouse. Irie Smokehouse, check them out. If you are in the DFW area, check them out. Good food. Uh, you know, they're awesome. Uh, shout out to the fam. Now, I have a surprise. Okay, I've been working on this. I have a series of journals out now. I have a series of journals on Amazon. If on Amazon.com, I have a series of journals. I have the Sermon Journal, uh, and then I have the Midnight uh, Sun Dream and Art Journal. I have the hard uh, cover right now, but I'm working on a soft cover uh, for young people, for children. Dream and Art Journal for children. It's not just you writing what you saw or dreamed about, but draw it. Okay? And, of course, you know, Jube means message journal. <laughs> yeah, Jube means message. So, uh, yes, we I have journals out on Amazon right now available, ready to roll. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll get some more going. We get some more things going. But I really appreciate you hanging with me. Uh, once again, you listen to King Cam and Jubay podcast. And Jubay means message. And today's message is the lands between or lands beyond Niger and Congo. I'll talk to you later.